Good evening and welcome. We are here to launch a new foundation initiative, the Pipeline Project. We will be working with community groups, with teachers, with local businesses to build a pipeline of student talent in the fields of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, or in the vernacular, STEAM. So tonight, you're going to hear about one of our pipeline project partners, DonorsChoose.org, and from Ayana Gabriel, our education program officer. As a chemical engineer and former classroom science teacher, Ayana knows firsthand what it takes to build a new pipeline of STEAM talent, and we're grateful for her leadership. So why are we undertaking this pipeline project? First, Arthur and his family, who serve as the trustees of the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation, have challenged the staff to find every way possible to reach children and families who are missing out. This is true across all of our program areas, whether they're missing out because they're not getting enough physical activity, whether they're kids who are missing out on wholesome, nutritious food, whether it's kids who don't have access to parks and green space, or students whose schools are not performing for them, or now these young people who are missing out on opportunities to let their natural curiosity become a lifelong passion that becomes a hobby, an academic pursuit, or a career. From our pre-K classes through elementary school and into middle school, the barriers of low expectations, limited resources, ill-equipped classrooms, gender discrimination, prevent children from moving through the STEAM pipeline. We want to turn that around. And we don't have all the answers, but we've worked with a lot of partners who have led us in the right direction. We've partnered with groups like the Steam Truck, Atlanta's first mobile makerspace, or Georgia First Robotics, whose self-proclaimed robot queens are teaching both boys and girls to build robots. Through small grants to the Maker Fair, Atlanta Science Festival, Opportunity Hub, Fireside, we've discovered community groups who are turning kids on to hands-on STEAM opportunities. And we know, all of us know, that Drew Charter School has been cited around the country for bringing project-based learning into the classroom. So we're learning from groups like these. Currently, Georgia forecasts growth in the STEAM professions but too few of our students are ready for those opportunities. So we're building a pipeline to new jobs as well. We all know that in the 21st century, we're gonna be looking for a different type of literacy to succeed. And STEAM is the access point to that new 21st century literacy that all of us are depending on our children and grandchildren to teach us. So we're grateful also to be inspired by classroom teachers who, in the face of extraordinary challenges, maintain this fierce devotion to every child. One of our national foundation colleagues has said over and over again, great teachers set learning on fire. And that's what, through these pipeline projects, we want to try to do, set learning on fire. So I understand there are a lot of classroom teachers in the audience tonight. If you are one, please stand up or raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you for being here, for your service, for your accomplishment, and for your relentless efforts to set learning on fire. And everyone in the room tonight can help these teachers and many others by joining the Pipeline Project. So here's how. In a few minutes, Charles Best will tell you exactly how DonorsChoose.org works. And we hope that teachers will use it
to acquire tools and supplies for STEAM projects in their classrooms. As part of the pipeline project, the Blank Foundation is matching gifts to eligible projects for public school teachers in Atlanta, Fulton, and DeKalb County districts. So when other, when other donors kick in, we match that one to one. And for everyone else here tonight, you may not know it, but you're a donor. Whether you've got $10 or hundreds of dollars, we're asking you to go to the, our website, blankfoundation.org slash pipeline, click on the donorschoose.org logo, and make a donation to a project that excites you. When you make your donation to an eligible project, we'll match it. There's not a better deal in town. So the, the title of tonight's program says it all. You choose, we match, 100 classrooms win. Lots more to tell you, but you're gonna hear a lot more tonight from Charles Best. So right now it's my privilege to ask Arthur Blank, the chairman of the Blank Family Foundation, and many other titles that you all know well to introduce our guest. Thank you, Patty. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna make my remarks really brief because I don't wanna take any time away from Charles Best tonight. Um, my fiance and I were at a uh, Giving Pledge uh, conference in Virginia. I think it was last June. Uh, we were there with Laura's um, father, Ted, uh, Ted Turner, and others. And uh, during the conference, uh, we had to make a selection one afternoon or the breakout sessions. We had to pick one of four. And, um, you know, frankly, three of them I couldn't understand at all. And um, I couldn't, I mean, it was an incredible conference. There were just the topics and the conversations were not one that, ones that I was familiar with. And I wasn't sure exactly what the Donuts Choose was all about either. But it made some sense to me. And I said to uh, Angie, I said, let's go attend this one. And, um, you know, in the next hour, or maybe a little less than that, but I was... Um, I felt like I was 20, 30 years younger listening to Charles Best and got so excited about the opportunity because I think, and this is really addressed to the teachers in this room tonight, um, I, I built, helped build a, a business that was based on listening. Uh, I'm talking about the, the Home Depot now, I'm not talking about the Falcons or our Major League Soccer franchise, our PGA business, all those are true as well, but we built that business based on listening to the customers, listening to the associates on the floors of over 2,000 stores throughout the United States and Canada and elsewhere. And one of the things that excites me and excited me in running our company for 23 years with my partner, Bernie, was that we always came back with great wisdom by listening to the people that were closest to the reality of the customers that we were serving. And what got me so excited about listening to Charles that day in Virginia was the, 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 the and he'll explain the way the program works, you know, very quickly, he can do it in 60 seconds or less beautifully, um, which is a unique town that, to be able to do that. But the beauty of this is that it connects, you know, the people's willingness to make a difference, to give back, to want to challenge their resources, big, small, whatever it may be, uh, to the actual needs that are represented by the students through the teachers in public schools throughout the United States. And, and to me, you, it's not, you know, often I sit in meetings and I listen to folks sit around, you know, fancy boardrooms and really nice tables and, and debate, you know, very f philosophical, high-level issues and approaches which you know, are not fundamentally wrong, but there may be 10, 20, 30 year kind of resolves. Uh, the beauty of what I think Donors Choose does and what Charles has created since 2000 is that it has the ability to make change immediately and it has the ability to respond immediately to what students are asking for, what teachers are asking for on behalf of their students. And the success, which I'll let him talk about since 2000, has been, uh, has been incredible. Um, I, I don't know the numbers the way Charles does the back of his hands, but you stop and think about this. This young, um, brilliant on entrepreneur that probably could have done a version of Home Depot himself 
um, has done it really in this, in this way. The organization has, uh, has mobilized in excess of 1.8 million donors since 2000, has contributed more than $330 million to fund 600,000 classroom projects that's affecting over 15 million students. Charles, during our foundation meeting today, talked about, somebody asked, one of our trustees asked him about his goals uh, in the next year or so, and I'll let him share that with you. But the important thing is this is an opportunity to make immediate impacts on kids, on, on giving our teachers the opportunities to arm themselves with what they know they need today to make a difference in the lives of our students. The other things we work on collect collectively and collaboratively in partnership with other things are, are endemic, they're, they're critical, we have to make changes long term, we get all that. But how do we impact these young folks today and support our teachers who are putting their time, their effort, their energy, their enthusiasm, and their commitments into making a difference? So without really further comment, Charles, let me bring you up. It's an honor to have you in Atlanta. Um, it really is. Um, we, we are looking forward to working with you. The pipeline project we're excited about, um, we think there's a tremendous need, but it really goes beyond just this one project. It goes into, you know, how do we listen? How do we listen to our students? How do we listen to our teachers? And how do we respond to them in a real way, quickly, to get resources in their hands that'll make a difference in the lives of the people that we all care about, which is our students? Thank you very much. Charles, welcome. There are few times in history when the saying, we're all in this together, would be more applicable than right now. Charles Best, he came up with a revolutionary idea during lunch in the teacher's lounge. My colleagues and I were talking about books that we wanted our students to read, field trips we wanted to take them on, art supplies that we needed, but these ideas wouldn't go beyond the teacher's lunchroom. And then I just figured that there were people from all walks of life who wanted to help improve our public schools. Through Donors Choose, ordinary citizens can directly fund projects initiated by enterprising public school teachers. Teachers request dictionaries, science kits, field trips, resources that their students need to thrive. Then you can give to the project request that most inspires you with a donation of any amount. It's such a simple, wonderful idea. You know exactly who you're helping and how you're helping them. I love to give and know that I, I have a connection. It's a very easy way to give back to public schools. This is exactly the kind of social innovation we should be encouraging across this country. I love DonorsChoose.org, and it's why I'm on the board and why I'm committed to helping it in any way I can. Make sure you check it out, DonorsChoose.org. Let's not underestimate the power each of us has to change the world for someone. Hey there, good evening. Um, I, I cannot tell you how excited I am to be here. Penny, thank you for your introduction. Arthur, uh, your introduction was one of the most generous and kind uh, anyone has ever given for me. I'm gonna work my very hardest to live up to your description and I'm just so grateful to you for having me here. Um, I understand that uh, music legend Usher and Grace are gonna be joining us. Uh, Shaka Zulu, Ludacris' manager, uh, is here. Uh, uh, we have Laura Turner uh, of the Captain Planet Foundation, and more importantly than those individuals, we have some of Atlanta's greatest teachers in this room. And that... That just gets me so excited to be speaking with you. And uh, knowing that I would be speaking with you tonight, uh, I wanted to get a feel for Atlanta. It's been a few years since I've been in this city, and because we're gonna be talking about crowdfunding. I figured I should take a crowdfunding tour of Atlanta. And I started at Kickstarter. How many of you are familiar with Kickstarter? How many of you have a back to project on Kickstarter? Raise your hands. All right, awesome, the majority of you. For, for those of you who didn't raise your hands, Kickstarter is a funding platform for creative projects. Last year, people raised more than $500 million for wacky and awesome ideas through the site. 
And we're looking at three projects that uh, creative people right here in Atlanta uh, have up on the site live right now. On the left, you see uh, a, the, an image representing Tracy and Domain's dream of creating a taco truck that will serve real Mexican street style tacos in the Atlanta area. It's named for a street in LA where uh, the very best Mexican tacos are made. And they've put up their project on Kickstarter to get the truck they need to bring those tacos to the people of Atlanta. In the middle, uh, you see an image of Elliot Holden. He's an Atlanta musician. He described himself as uh, Jimi Hendrix if Jimi Hendrix had been produced by Dr. Dre. And he wants, he wants to uh, record an album, and so he's got a project up on Kickstarter right now to do just that. And on the right, you see a childhood book that uh, a local woman here in Atlanta, Helen Wu, wants to publish and distribute to children all across the country. And to make that possible, she's got a project up on Kickstarter. Now, only five years ago, these creative Atlanta residents, Tracy and Domain, Elliot Holden, Helen Wu, they would have needed uh, a rich uncle or industry connections or years of working their way up the ladder before they could have done these projects. But Kickstarter does away with all that. It lets you ask your friends and the world at large to support your creativity without any tastemakers or gatekeepers standing in your way. If your idea is awesome, it'll probably get funded. So after checking out the uh, Kickstarter Atlanta offerings, I took my, my tour to Etsy. How many of you have bought an item on Etsy recently? Let's see uh, a show of hands. Okay, just a, a, a little bit fewer than the folks who've backed projects on Kickstarter. So the, for those who aren't familiar, Etsy is a marketplace of things that are made by hand. And what you may not know is that crafters Artisans in Atlanta have 173,000 different items for sale on Etsy. We're looking at just three of them, made by Atlanta crafters. You could get um, Bill Murray uh, coasters made by someone in Atlanta. You could get a My Little Pony pajama suit uh, <laughs> sewed by an Atlanta uh, uh, craftswoman. Uh, or you could get note cards uh, adorned with doggy treats, some of Atlanta's finest crafts right there. Um, now, the people who make things by hand and sell them on Etsy used to work office jobs all day, reluctantly. They really wanted to be crafting, but they could only do that as a hobby in their spare time. Few of these people could have raised the money you need to make a prototype that a factory can manufacture, or persuade Macy's or Walmart to sell their product, or raise millions of advertising dollars to get consumers to buy their product. That's a process which lets only a lucky few become designers, and of course it's a process that can uh, sometimes suck the, the personality out of your creation. But then Etsy came along. And now crafters can pursue their passion as their day job and sell their works to people all over the world. They don't have to break through all the barriers that until recently stood in the way of anyone who wanted to make beautiful things for a living. So after checking out uh, all that Atlanta has to offer on Kickstarter and Etsy, of course, I had to go to donorschoose.org and check out some of the more than 2,000 classroom projects that Atlanta teachers have gotten funded through our site. Uh, on the left, uh, you see students in Miss Keel's classroom. She teaches at Agnes Jones Elementary School. And she, indeed, it's an honor to have you here. So we're talking about Ms. Keel at Agnes Jones Elementary School uh, who wanted a podium, just like this, for her students to be able to, to become public speakers. It was a $200 request that was funded by two donors who don't even live in Georgia. In the middle, uh, you see students in Mrs. Marsha's classroom at Garden Hills Elementary School. Is, is, is she actually here? Are you, are you her colleagues? Yes. Okay, awesome. Can you, can you testify that Mrs. Marsh at Garden Hills Elementary School uh, did indeed put up a project requesting an alphabet rug so that her kindergartners would have a place to sit that would enable them to learn and touch the letters of the alphabet and the numbers that they needed to comprehend? Is that true? Yes, and she does it bilingually. And she does it bilingually. Yes. 
Awesome. And, and Mrs. Marsh's rug project for her kindergartners was also funded not only by donors in Atlanta, but by people all over the country. And finally, uh, on the right, you see a project from Mrs. Onayuga, who teaches at Frederick Douglass High School, who, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Uh, am I pronouncing her last name correctly? All right, all right. So this is a project for a garden uh, because Mrs. Onayuga wants to create a garden where students will learn how to uh, plant seeds and uh, pollinate uh, vegetables and flowers and apply all that they're learning in economics and math and science to this garden by selling the vegetables that they grow, uh, by doing experiments on the soil. And she was requesting a wheelbarrow and uh, shovels and rakes. It was an $800 project also funded by people all over the country. Now at DonorsChoose.org, teachers go straight to the public with their best ideas for helping their students learn. They don't have, those teachers don't have to fill something out in triplicate or get uh, an administrator to sign off or first pay their dues. In fact, there's nothing standing between their idea and a potential supporter. There's a change underway, which I wanna talk about with you, talk with you about this evening. It's a change in who you have to know and how long you have to wait and how lucky you have to be to bring a good idea to life. It's about a new kind of marketplace where gatekeepers do not stand in your way. Now, some people call this new movement crowdfunding, and DonorsChoose.org is a, a pioneer of this movement. So I want to tell you the inside story of how it got off the ground. And then we're going to do something that I think has never been done before at this speaker series. That's going to be the secret that we'll reveal at the end. Now, before we tell that story, I have one last question for you. How many of you had a teacher in high school who changed your life? Raise your hands. All right, just about everybody. That's awesome. That's, that's great to see. I had a teacher like that myself. His name was Mr. Buxton. I'm going to show you a picture of him. There he is. So Mr. Buxton was uh, my high school English teacher and my wrestling coach. And when I showed up as a a uh, dorky freshman in high school, Mr. Buxton spoke to me like he would to any adult. If he approved or disapproved of something I'd done, I knew it right away, because he didn't have that mask that some grown-ups have when they're talking to kids. If I asked him a question on Wednesday, he'd come back to me on Friday saying that he'd thought about it, and he really had. He made you feel like he wanted you on his team. And looking back on it, I think it was Mr. Buxton who made me want to be a teacher. So uh, 15 years ago, I started teaching history at Wings Academy, a public high school in the Bronx. But the high school where I was teaching did not have the same resources as when I was in Mr. Buxton's classroom. Where I went to high school, we went on field trips into the woods, we had graphing calculators for trigonometry, we had the supplies to do just about any art project we did not want for anything. But when I started teaching in the Bronx, I saw firsthand that all schools are not created equal. My colleagues and I would spend a lot of our own money on copy paper and pencils. I see some nodding heads. I suspect that just about every teacher in this room has gone deeply into their own pocket every year uh, to buy supplies for their students. And my colleagues and I would talk in the teacher's lunchroom about books that we wanted our students to read and a field trip we wanted to take them on and a science experiment we wanted to run. What I wanted to do uh, was to give my students each a copy of Little House on the Prairie. Those of you who only saw the TV show might think I was dumbing things down, but if you read the book, you will remember that Little House on the Prairie is actually a gripping, unsentimental account of pioneer life. And I will talk all night about how awesome that book is. But uh, <laughs> my, my students, even those who had never left New York City, they loved this book too. But the New York City school system was not about to underwrite with the Little House on the Prairie series for my students. So I, I would get up about five in the morning and I would go to the copy shop that was open uh, 24 hours a day and I would make photocopies of that day's section of Little House on the Prairie, which probably violated a lot of copyright laws. Um, but uh, as, as, I was making, as I was making those photocopies, I started thinking about all those resources, those books, that field trip, that, that science experiment that my colleagues wanted for their students. And it just occurred to me that there must be people out there who'd wanna help teachers like us 
if they could see exactly where their money was going. So using pencil and paper, I drew out this website where public school teachers could create classroom project requests and donors could choose the project that they wanted to support. Uh, for $2,000, a programmer who had recently arrived from Poland was willing to build that site. It was super rudimentary. Uh, the, the back end of the site was one page and you'd have to scroll down and down and down for like 15 minutes to get to the teacher or the project you were looking for. To process a donation, I had one of those black boxes that you see at the grocery store where you punch in the credit card number and the dollar amount and you send it over a telephone line and it's like PayPal but by hand. Uh, and it's a really good thing my students were helping me to get the site off the ground. And then I had to get my colleagues to try out this new site. Now for the teachers in the room, I don't know what it's like at your schools, but at the high school where I was teaching, if you wanted to get teachers to do something, you gave them free food. <laughs> I actually think somebody anticipated, uh, someone said free food before I even said it. Uh, so, so that is uh, my mom's roasted pear dessert. She does, these, she does these roasted pears with orange rind and apricot jam and spices, and they taste something delicious. So my mom made 11 of these pears, and I brought them into the teacher's lunchroom, and as my colleagues prepared to pounce, I said, hold up, there's a toll. If you, if you eat one of these pears, you have to go to this new website called Donors Choose and ask for whatever it is you most want for your students. Propose the project that you've always wanted to do with them. Sounded like a pretty good deal. Took them like 20 seconds to scarf the 11 pairs. And, and then they proceeded to post the first projects on our site. The health teacher, she wanted Baby Think It Over dolls, uh, which are uh, life size, life weight dolls that cry at three in the morning and need to be fed and show a teenager what their responsibilities would be uh, if they were to become a parent. The English teacher, he wanted to get his students ready for the SAT. He requested uh, test prep books. The art teacher wanted to do a wall-to-wall -wall quilt with each of her students sewing a square, and for that she needed fabric and thread and needles. The other history teacher and I wanted our students to meet Mokhtar Tayeb. He had been profiled in The New Yorker after escaping from modern-day slavery in Mauritania and West Africa. And our students had just finished reading the autobiography of Frederick Douglass. And we thought how incredible it would be if our students could meet a man, a living person who himself had escaped from slavery. So our students read uh, this profile in The New Yorker, connected it to the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, and then we posted a project so that Mokhtar Tayeb could come into our school and our students could talk with him. So those, those were four of the first 11 project requests up on our site. My aunt, who's a nurse, she funded the first project but I didn't know any more donors to fund the other 10 projects. <laughs> so I funded them myself, um, which I could afford to do because I was still living at home with my parents and they weren't charging me any rent, so I could spare some of my teacher's salary to, to fund uh, my colleagues' projects. And because I donated anonymously, my colleagues mistakenly thought that the website actually worked. <laughs> and that there were all these donors on the site just waiting to fulfill teachers' classroom <laughs> dreams. So that rumor spread across the Bronx and teachers started posting hundreds of projects, projects that needed a whole lot more money than what I could afford by living at home with my parents. And I was in a really tough spot not knowing how I was gonna get these projects funded. But my students, they, they could see the potential of this experiment to change their lives at school. And so they volunteered every day for four months to write letters to people all over the country telling them about this website where someone with $10 could be a classroom hero. We wanted to get the cheapest postal rate, so uh, we sorted the mail ourselves, and every desk in my classroom was uh, piled high with letters representing a different region of the country. And then we carted the sorted letters to the post office, and we crossed our fingers. It worked. My students' letter writing campaign generated $30,000 in donations to classroom projects on our site, and we were off. Another year went by. More teachers in the Bronx created projects, donors funded some of them, and then 9-11 happened. And teachers at the schools beside Ground Zero started creating projects on our site to recover from the attacks on the World Trade Center. I remember there was, um, 
It was a math teacher whose students' calculators were sealed at the disaster site. Their classroom had been relocated to a basement, and she was requesting a new set of calculators for her students. There was uh, an art teacher who wanted to bring in an, an artist from Afghanistan uh, to do after-school workshops so students could meet someone from that country. There was a first-grade teacher whose students had been saved by a particular group of firemen, and her first graders wanted to thank the firemen who had saved them by doing a musical performance in front of their fire ladder company, and for that they needed musical instruments. There were hundreds of these projects related to 9-11, and I thought that local media would jump at this opportunity to, uh, to, to, to participate in the recovery effort. This was right when uh, people were making so many blood donations to the Red Cross that uh, they couldn't even take more donations, and here was this direct way for people to help. But no local reporter would give me the time of day. I think I, I, think I called a uh, hundred of them uh, with no success. So I figured I'd better aim higher. Holy Grail was the New York Times. They had a reporter, a new reporter, covering nonprofits and philanthropy. Her name was Stephanie Strom, and I figured if we could get Stephanie Strom of the New York Times to do a story about our site, we would have a shot at big-time impact. So I put together a package of materials, mailed them to Stephanie Strom at the New York Times, and I didn't hear back. Uh, so I called her up a few weeks later, and uh, she was nice to me, but she said that we were uh, not exactly newsworthy. She said, you know, if ever I'm, I'm doing a, a listing of online charities, which at the time was still a new concept, you know, maybe I'll put you on that list, but uh, I'm afraid, I'm afraid you're, you're, uh, you're pretty small potatoes. Damn. So then I found a directory of the top people at Newsweek, and I called the senior editor there, Jonathan Alter. I called him first because his last name began with A, so he showed up first in the alphabetical directory. Uh, and I called him during my lunch hour, and his assistant must have been out to lunch because he picked up the phone. And I said, hey, I'm a teacher up in the Bronx. I started this nonprofit with my students. Do you want to hear about it? And he said, sure. He didn't hang up on me. We talked for 45 minutes, and that night he wrote a column for the Newsweek website saying that this experiment growing out of a Bronx classroom might one day change philanthropy. So then I called up Stephanie Strom at the New York Times, all excited, and <laughs> I was like, hey, Newsweek saw us as newsworthy, at least for their website, so you know, won't you give us a second look? And then she dashed my hopes. She said, I wouldn't touch your story with a 10-foot pole now that another reporter has covered you. The New York Times does not follow in the footsteps of other publications. I felt like an idiot for having told her that another media outlet had, had broken our story. So I wrote her an email apologizing for, for being so dumb. And she, she could tell how badly I felt. She took pity. She wrote me back. And she said, you know, you shouldn't feel quite so bad because you didn't have a chance in the first place. <laughs> because, because her editors had asked her to focus strictly on charities responding to 9-11. So there was my last opening. I spent like two hours crafting this email to Stephanie saying, hey, before, before you totally tune me out, you should know that there are a lot of classroom projects being created by teachers at Ground Zero, all focused on 9-11. I wrote this email to her. I called her up one more time over the weekend so I would go straight to voicemail and I wouldn't interrupt her while she was on deadline. And I said, this is the last time you'll ever hear from me if you could just read this one final email. Monday, I was back at school teaching and I checked my email in between periods and Stephanie Strom had written back. She wanted to come do an interview for a major feature story in the New York Times. Now let me tell you, I, I was over the moon. My parents raised me to be humble, but this was the New York Times. It felt like, it felt like the skies had opened and I had to shout. So I forwarded Mrs. Strom's email to my friend and I said, Guess who said she wouldn't touch our story with a 10-foot pole and now wants an interview? That's what hustling will get you. I beat my chest. I talked all kinds of smack. <laughs> and I, I, I thought... <laughs> I, I, I thought that, that I had hit forward. <laughs> but, but I had hit reply. <laughs> and... And the moment I realized I yanked the electrical cord from out of the socket to, to shut off the computer, but it was too late. 
And I, I sent that trash talking. Guess who said she wouldn't touch our story with a 10 foot pole and now wants an interview? Email directly to Stephanie Strom, <laughs> philanthropy reporter for the New York Times. So naturally I sent her another email apologizing for being so dumb. <laughs> and to Ms. Strom's eternal credit, she did not hold it against me. She went on to write uh, a major feature story for the Times saying that DonorsChoose.org might be the future of philanthropy. And since that time, we've been trying to, to prove her right. Arthur was nice enough to mention some of our uh, statistics, but uh, today all, we're getting on almost two million people who have given more than $300 million to classroom projects at more than half of all the public schools in America. It's, it's 14 million students who've now got books and art supplies and field trips and uh, recording devices and butterfly cocoons and therapeutic horseback riding that they need for a great education. And here in Georgia, uh, people have donated more than $8.6 $8 .6 million to classroom projects on our site. There's uh, more than 300,000 kids in Georgia who've gotten materials and more than 14,000 projects funded. My students and I, when we were working on this experiment, this kind of clunky website 15 years ago, we never dreamed that um, I, would, I would get to come and speak with folks like you uh, and that we would have numbers to share like these. And we certainly never dreamed that uh, crowdfunding would become uh, part of the zeitgeist. When DonorsChoose.org began, crowdfunding was years away from even being uh, a word. But uh, today, it's, it's a movement. There are now hundreds of websites where people on the front lines can identify a need they see, propose a project they want to do, secure a loan for a small venture they want to start. And now anyone can become a philanthropist, uh, a patron of the arts, a financier. There are hundreds of these sites. So I, I want to give you now an inside uh, look at how we've made crowdfunding work in public schools in the United States. Now, when a teacher creates a project for funding, we first make sure it's legit, and we email follow-up questions to the teacher if anything isn't clear about what learning is going to take place. This school year alone, we'll get about 240,000 classroom project requests, each of which has to be carefully vetted and reviewed. And we used to pay people to do that work of reading over each project, reviewing it, and vetting it. And then we realized that our best teacher users were ready to volunteer their time to vet other teachers' project requests. So now, if you're a teacher and you've had like 30 projects funded on our site, we invite you to uh, volunteer to vet other teachers' project requests. It's like, as we discussed today, like academic peer review meets Wikipedia. And now that we have uh, crowdsourced uh, this labor to our best teacher users, the time it takes us to vet and post a teacher's project has gone from eight days when we were paying people to do it to one and a half days now that we've turned to our own teacher users to become our coworkers, which is what crowdfunding is all about. It's about pushing intelligence out to the edge and, and seeing your so-called beneficiaries as your colleagues. So now the project's up on donorschoose.org, and it's time for people to choose which projects they want to fund. At any given moment, there are about 40,000 classroom project requests live on our site, and that's a lot to pick from. So we encourage donors to express a personal passion and look at the projects that match. A few years ago, there was a writer uh, for Fortune magazine doing a story on Kiva and donorschoose.org as the two websites that Fortune thought were going to change philanthropy. And when we were done talking, the writer seemed like, decently impressed by our site, but he said that his personal passion was saving the salmon in the Pacific Northwest. Education wasn't quite his cause. But before he left the room, I did a keyword search for salmon in the Northwest on Donors Choose, and up came five classroom projects. The second result was from a teacher at a high school in Oregon who had created a salmon hatchery in the river flowing by his school, and he needed hip waders for his students to go into the river and maintain and build out this salmon hatchery. The top result was a project from a teacher on an island off Alaska, teaching in a one-room schoolhouse. She wrote in her project essay that she was 45 minutes away from the nearest store by airplane. 
And all of our students are native Alaskans, and they had recorded their parents' folk tales about salmon, done research on salmon, and wanted to share that work with the outside world. So here was this guy who had a passion for salmon and five projects to choose from. And as a result, as a group of kids at an Oregon high school who now have the hip waders they need uh, to build out their salmon hatchery. Last part uh, of the DonorsChoose.org process is, is the best part. When a teacher gets a project funded, we don't hand out cash to the teacher. Instead, we purchase the resources and have them delivered to the classroom. If the project uh, is seeking therapeutic horseback riding for disabled students, we're paying the horseback riding stable to provide that service. And then uh, every donor, no matter how much money they've given, even if they've given just $1, gets photographs of their project in action, uh, a thank you note from the teacher, an impact letter describing what students are learning. Donors who give $50 or more also get handwritten student thank you letters so that every donor can see and feel the impact that they've had and even correspond back and forth with the teacher they chose to help. Throughout this process, we try to be totally transparent. And I'll give you one, one example of that. Once in a while, maybe like two or three percent of the time, the classroom isn't able to provide those thank you letters. Maybe it's because the teacher was laid off or went on maternity leave or changed schools. It's usually a good reason, but internally, we call this a jilted donor situation. And when it happens, we contact the donor and acknowledge that we've fallen short, even though they've probably forgotten that they were ever due a package of thank you letters in the first place. And we invite them to pick another project to fund on our dime. Now, it might sound like a a sacrificial fall on your sword thing to do, but most of our donors are blown away that we would proactively apologize for not having provided that package of thank you letters. Few of them take us up on our offer of funding another project for them, but our apology note does often prompt them to make a whole new donation. We once looked at the numbers and concluded that our biggest revenue driver was screwing up and admitting it. Which I, which I think has, has implications. Kind of the, the way that people will reward you for being transparent and honest, I think, has, has implications in all sorts of, of other fields. So that's how DonorsChoose.org began. Uh, that's how it works under the hood. I want to tell you about uh, one criticism of our site, which is that DonorsChoose.org is a Band-Aid solution. The, the accusation here is that we treat the symptoms but not the causes of educational inequity. There are a lot of uh, sort of traditional uh, uh, old line foundations out there that will say, we're not interested because we don't think you're, you're changing the system itself. They'll say, where's the beef? Maybe they'll even worry that donors choose lets government off the hook by letting private citizens step in when the system is falling short. Tonight, I want to respond to that accusation, to that skepticism. I actually think that there are a few ways that our site could not only deliver books and art supplies and science equipment uh, and, and amazing experiences, but could help to change the system itself. One of those ways uh, starts with uh, a little pop quiz, and that is, is anybody able to recognize what those two devices are? 3D okay, 3D printer. You got the one on the left. Can anyone uh, recognize and shout out what the thing on the right is? All right, I haven't heard it yet. We're gonna to get to it in a second. So uh, indeed, the, the, the device on the left is a 3D printer. The device on the right is an underwater robot, which is a, a video camera uh, that students can use to uh, explore the, the ocean depths. Now, for quite some time, there was a major match offer on our site for any teacher requesting a 3D printer. And there was a match offer on our site for any teacher requesting this underwater robot so that they could take their students 12,000 leagues under the sea. Maybe not quite that deep, but deep enough to uh, experience an underwater ecosystem that they would never otherwise come in contact with. And the companies behind these two devices would never have attempted to sell into K-12 uh, education. That's something that requires a sales force and a group of lobbyists that are like 200 strong, and you've got to uh, navigate a whole sort of educational industrial complex. But by using DonorsChoose.org, these two companies were able to introduce 3D printing and underwater exploration directly to hundreds of thousands of students in low-income communities. And it's getting bigger. Uh, in just a few weeks, uh, there'll be a documentary coming out about Malala. 
And the filmmakers are using Donors Choose so that they can directly let teachers know about this incredible new film and provide an incentive, a match offer incentive for any teacher who seeks funding to take their students to see Malala. By the way, if anyone, here, if any of the teachers here want to see that movie, put up a project and it'll get almost all the way funded. Uh, and there's another teacher in California who used our site recently to equip all of her students with stand-up desks because she thinks that if students are standing when they're learning, those, uh, especially boys who have a lot of energy, a lot of restless energy, are actually able to exert it and they can listen much more closely to the teacher. And yet, I think most superintendents are not yet persuaded uh, of the wisdom of stand-up desks. It still seems like kind of newfangled and weird. Uh, but by using DonorsChoose.org, really forward-thinking teachers are able to get awesome inventions for their kids now. And we think that a lot of sort of ed tech entrepreneurs and inventors may adopt a similar strategy. There's another way we think we can change the system, and that is by opening up all the data generated by teachers like those in this room creating projects on our site. So more than 300,000 teachers have created 800,000 classroom project requests on our site. So we can now, by opening up the data attached to all those projects, we can let policymakers and budget makers see what resources teachers most need, what books middle school teachers in Georgia think are most effective at getting kids hooked on reading, what technology devices Atlanta high school teachers think are most important as expressed by the projects that they're posting on our site so that the powers that be can listen to classroom teachers because we think that hardworking classroom teachers know their kids better than anybody else in the system. And if we can give those teachers voice if we can give those teachers a seat at the budget-making table, we will have much wiser spending of education dollars. And we have two data scientists who are just starting to uh, uh, explore the potential of our data. They've started by looking at uh, giving dynamics on our site. And they found that uh, women tend to donate to classroom projects throughout the school year, while men tend to donate on special occasions. And we could only hypothesize, we could only hypothesize that um, Altruism comes naturally to women, but men need an external stimulus to like remind them to be uh, altruistic. Uh, I'm not gonna ask Leos and Cancers to raise their hand because donors with your astrological sign uh, make smaller donations and give less frequently. Uh, Aries and Taurus uh, make um, fewer donations, sorry, you, you make smaller donations, but you give frequently. Are there any Capricorns in the room uh, who wanna raise their hand? So, we have no idea why, but your cohort actually makes more donations and larger donations, and we have no explanation as to why that could be. Getting a little bit more serious, we took a look at 103,000 book projects on our site and at the books that were most frequently requested, and the short of it is, if you're a middle school teacher or if you are looking at funding books for middle school kids, make sure you've got Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And I see some nodding heads as well on that. Here's one final analysis, which you don't have to examine, but I will explain to you. And it's an analysis of the impact of the recession on low income versus upper income public schools. And what we found is that after the recession, teachers in low income public schools started posting many more projects for basic materials like copy paper and pencils and dictionaries as compared to enrichment projects like a field trip to Washington DC or butterfly cocoons for a science experiment. Whereas in upper income public schools, the recession led to no such increase in the proportion of requests for really basic stuff, which told us that the recession has had a terribly regressive, disparate impact on public schools, leaving kids in low income communities without basic materials that they need to learn, whereas kids in upper income communities, while maybe still financially struggling, at least do have the basics in their classrooms. And this is just scratching the surface uh, of the potential of the data we've opened up, but it, the headline here is really that um, teachers are telling the powers that be what materials are most needed, what technology they most need, what activities are trending in the projects that they're creating on our site, and policymakers and budget makers can now listen to classroom teachers. Final way that we think we could change the system itself is politically the spiciest. I'm genuinely eager to hear your reaction. And that is a new take, a new approach to the merit pay debate. So the way it started 
The way it started was a few years ago, we were lucky enough to win the Google Impact Award, and it came with a $5 million grant. And we used that grant to underwrite Donors Choose classroom funding credits that we gave to teachers who launched and helped their students pass math and science AP courses. So the way it worked was, if you were a teacher in a low-income public high school and you raised your hand and said, all right, I'm going to start a physics AP course or a calculus AB course, you were given upfront Donors Choose classroom funding credits so you could fund your own projects and get the graphing calculators you would need or build the lab that you would need. And then at the end of the school year, every student who passed the math or science AP exam unlocked $100 of donors choose classroom funding credits for their teacher. So if you were one of these participating teachers and 20 of your students passed the calculus AB exam, you got a $2,000 classroom funding credit. Google was excited enough about the results that they took this approach with girls learning to code. And for a few months last school year, any public school teacher in America could take down $1,000 of donors choose classroom funding credits if and when four of their female students demonstrated proficiency in computer science fundamentals using either Code Academy or Khan Academy. Now this might look like, smell like, sound like performance pay, merit pay, because it's a financial reward commensurate to student educational outcomes, but by switching the currency with which the reward is paid from cash to classroom funding credits, we've created something completely different. And actually, the leaders of both teachers' unions have responded really positively to this approach to rewarding excellence. Because you can imagine, we're speaking to teachers' hearts rather than to their wallets. Because newsflash, teachers didn't get into teaching because of all the money that they could make. Um, and we're simply looking to say, when you've done something incredible with your students, we want to invite you, the teacher, to decide how to further transform your classroom with credits that will enable you to get the books, the art supplies, the science equipment that you need. And imagine what it's like for students who can say, you see that classroom library that just got delivered yesterday? I got that for our classroom when I passed the physics AP exam. That field trip we went on yesterday, I made that possible when I learned how to code. So in this sort of venomous debate over merit pay, we, we've kind of hacked it and created something where I think that uh, the reform warriors and the teachers' unions uh, could actually come to agreement on this sort of alternative approach to rewarding amazing teachers who do amazing things with their students. So those are just three examples of how we think we could help to change the very system itself. So that is basically it on my talk. Now it's time to do something that uh, has not happened before in this speaker series. The Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation was uh, generous enough to say, all right, instead of there being any like honorarium or anything like that, instead, let's take that and invite everybody in this room to go forth tonight and become a micro-philanthropist. So that is why each of you has an envelope on the table that you can open now or later that holds a $25 donorschoose.org gift card for you to spend on a classroom project of your choice. And my, my challenge to you is to do like that Fortune magazine writer and express a personal passion. You could search for gardening because you've been thinking about that topic lately. You could search for your favorite books being requested that were written by your favorite author, Roald Dahl or Dr. Seuss or uh, uh, Stephen Hawkins, who knows? You could do a search for the sport you played in high school, your favorite subject uh, in high school, a topic that you've been thinking about. Express a passion, look at the classroom project requests that match, and choose a project that, that really speaks to you personally. This, what, what you're holding is uh, actually the gift of giving that Stephen Colbert gives to every guest uh, who goes on his show. Uh, and there are all sorts of people who've picked all sorts of interesting uh, projects. But uh, what I am most curious to see is the projects that you choose to support. And I hope that when you spend this $25 gift of giving on a classroom project of your choice, that you will tell the teacher why you picked their project. That's part of our checkout flow. And we want you to explain to the teacher why you picked their project. And as you're doing so, I hope you will appreciate what you and an awesome teacher can do together when gatekeepers do not stand in your way. Thank you so much for your time tonight. I so appreciate it. Thank you. 
I've had the pleasure of being able to look through the over 40 projects that are already on uh, DonorsShoes.org as part of this um, initiative, and a couple things struck me. So one, I was really impressed with some of the innovative projects. So uh, Mr. Farley at Sequoia Middle School uh, posted a project for a hovercraft, which I hope I get to visit his classroom so I can use it. And one of the things I loved about that is he is trying to do something that is beyond the typical school day, and he has his students building the hovercraft. And so this aligns with the type of innovation and skills behind STEAM, that the kids are not just buying it and learning it, but they're actually gonna build it themselves. It gets with the tinkering, the maker movement, and then they're gonna learn the physics behind what they're building. Uh, another project that we loved was Mrs. Kuser's project, um, where she is asking for field books so that her elementary school students can go outside and observe the natural world. And what's great about this is um, there are skills behind STEAM. There is uh, observation, curiosity, creativity, the ability to take data, analyze data. And so to build those skills in elementary school students is really, really important. So projects that demonstrate that the teacher is trying to build STEAM skills, it's really good. And then I think the last of the projects, and Charles mentioned this, are unfortunately we do have a lot of teachers who just need basic supplies. So I was thinking about a project, uh, Mr. Howard's classroom at King Middle School, where he's asking for iPads so he can teach his students that tablets are not just for toys, but they actually can learn from them. I was thinking about another teacher who wanted to buy graphing calculators for a special ed students. Really important that underserved kids are not always just kids in low income classrooms, that we know sometimes the special ed students are left out of the science classrooms, even in inclusion. And really impressed with a project from Mr. G's classroom at Carver High School that was asking for the PSA system so that his choral kids can keep on uh, performing their choral um, presentations. And so just thinking about the wide range of STEAM, we have projects here that go all the way from innovative in the hovercraft to making sure kids have graphing calculators. And so I think that it's really important to think that STEAM is not just the acronym of the letters, but there's a big umbrella that falls under. So, Ayana, thank you. And, you know, for a lot of us, um, the STEAM acronym mm -hmm. feels a little bit overused. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what we mean in the Pipeline Project. Why, why are we using that, and, and what's it about? Okay, definitely. So besides the science, technology, engineering, art, and math, I'm thinking about the idea of the maker movement, which is really huge, the idea that kids learn from doing. We know that kids, more than anything else, are plugged in technology. They need engagement. They need to be tinkering. They need to be building. They need to be investigating. Um, so I think about uh, also design thinking, where kids are able to learn problem solving and able to learn how to prototype something, how to test it, how to do trial and error. And then thinking about a lot of things that kids already do but may not realize their steam. So we know our kids like to play video games. We know they all like to get on the smartphone and they like to get on a tablet. So robotics, gaming, coding, arts, entertainment, all of those things are STEAM. And being able to help kids understand the technology behind that, being able to help them understand that somebody had to create that game that they play five hours a day is really, really important because they may become the one who creates it in the future. That's great, thank you. Well, I'm going to come back to some questions for both of you, but I would like to open it up to our audience to see what questions you have for either Charles or Ayana. And while we're waiting for people to come up, um, Ayana, this DonorsChoose.org piece of our pipeline in initiative is one piece of it. But we're also, come to the microphone, but we're also, there's another piece where we're asking community organizations and nonprofits to apply for grants. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, definitely. So one of the spirits of this project is being able to get to the people who are with kids. So we know teachers are with kids, and then kids are also in after school programs, summer school programs, and informal learning. And so there is a component of the grant where you can apply directly through the blank foundation, uh, org slash pipeline, and community groups can apply. So if you know an after school program, a summer school program, a boys and girls club, or any place where kids may be spending time out of the classroom, we're also looking to help support those because we know that, particularly in the summer, that kids need that type of engagement. So we're trying to get in the classroom to teachers and outside of the classroom to where young people are. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Kim Moore, and you've really inspired me, Mr. Best. Um, until recently. Definitely, Charles. 
Until recently, um, I worked for Invent Now, which is a nonprofit that sponsors the National Inventors Hall of Fame Collegiate Inventors Competition and Camp for Young Inventors. And while in that role, I became very inspired to, um, to step outside my comfort zone, which was as a teacher for years and training and working with teachers, um, to start an ed tech company called Field Trip Zoom. It capitalizes on um, working with museums, centers, and zoos all around the world. And um, you have inspired me to go to our providers, which are um, the Alaska Sea Life Centers, especially as you're thinking about your um, STEAM initiatives, um, the Liberty Science Center. Um, there are over 400 programs um, which are very well known, like the Smithsonian and others that have partnered with us. And so what I've done is asked that they donate um, 10 long distance learning opportunities for educators in Atlanta, Fulton, and DeKalb County. Great. So we like to um, find a way that we could possibly filter this through someone and um, provide these great classroom opportunities for these students. Thank you. I'll be sure talk, to find you afterwards. And talk to Ayana, <laughs> yeah. both to What's Charles that? and Ayana. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Great. Yes. Hi, I'm Katie Landis, director of the Georgia Statewide After School Network. I want to first say thank you to Charles. As a former Atlanta Public Schools teacher who is honored to receive funding from Donors Choose, and my husband. What did you get teacher, funding for? Um, Storybooks for kindergarten where they could write their own autobiographies in, in kindergarten. And then my husband is a teacher in DeKalb County and this summer raised over $5,000 for books for his AP economics class. But then my question, and my also thank you to the Blank Foundation for after school programs for including those out of school time programs, community based organizations in this movement. But then I guess my question to you, Charles, is for your work with Donors Shoes, what are some of the lessons that you've learned about innovative funding and sustainable? funding that can be used in this out of school time space that may not be involved at the school day where they struggle even more so, more so sometimes mm -hmm. for funding for these innovative projects. Yeah. Well, teachers, so long as they're full-time teachers at that public school or charter school, they can create after school uh, funding requests. Uh, there are lots of teachers who will say, I want these five kids of mine to be able to participate in this particular program that's gonna come to our school and give them after school test prep tutoring and it's gonna cost $1,000 and that's their project and when the project is funded, we pay that nonprofit or that local organization to provide that after school experience. Um, but I think if there are uh, lessons that could apply to other nonprofits, it's really, I think that um, when you enable a donor to feel like uh, they are not just consummating a donation, but beginning a relationship with a classroom, all kinds of stuff is possible. I think it's about enabling donors to feel like they are protagonists in a story and, and not just a checkbook, and enabling people to connect, w to express their own passions and give based on those passions, and I think that that should apply to after school uh, support. There, there's, a, there's an organization called Wishbone, uh, which is a kind of crowdfunding and donors choose for summer experiences. Uh, and maybe to your point, uh, there's one that ought to emerge for uh, after school experiences. Great, thank, thank you. you. Yes. Yeah, hi, um, my name is uh, Brian Shoemaker and I'm a STEAM coordinator at the Howard School. Uh, we are a small private special needs school on the west side of Atlanta. And so thank you for coming out and speaking to us tonight. I think it's amazing what you've done um, as, a, as a classroom teacher, uh, I really appreciate that somebody took those bitching sessions at the teacher's lounge at lunch and turned it into something good. <laughs> we, all, you know, we all complain about the situation, but you've actually done something about it. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make a proposal to mm -hmm. you, and that is to just open your mind and think about um, broadening the audience, perhaps, yeah. and opening up Donors Choose to private schools yeah. that teach ch uh, children with special needs. And maybe have a cutoff of, you know, the population has to be 80% special needs or something. Right. Because we have, tuition at our school is very expensive. So if you looked at our tuition, you would think we're rolling in the money. Yeah. But the truth is, the way that we reach our kids is by having lots of adults in the classroom. We have speech language pathologists, we have literacy specialists, we have support teachers and lead teachers, and our classroom size is very small. So it's a very expensive thing that we do. 
um, but we don't make much money, and our kids still suffer from the opportunity gap that you all are talking about with access to STEAM, because they spend a lot of time in their academic lives making up for their deficiencies in other areas. Yeah. Yeah. And so I would love to see private schools like mine and the teachers at my school who work so hard to reach the kids who haven't been served by their own public schools. We have kids coming from 60 different zip codes to our school because they're not, they're not being served. And, and for no fault of trying, yeah. it's just that a lot of public schools can't put in the money to make it work. Absolutely. Thank you. We, we're not fixated on only serving public and charter schools. We're, we're fixated on uh, serving students from low-income communities and, and leveling the playing field when it comes to the resources available to, to kids in our country. And um, we, we will think about what criteria we could use to uh, allow certain types of, of parochial schools, private schools, et cetera. It's, it's as much an operational issue as a it's an, strictly an operational issue, not a philosophical one. Um, let's talk more afterward. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, how are you? I'm Tamiko Nichols. I am executive director for Drama Kids International. It's an international franchise. Yes, I'm a business owner and entrepreneur, but I'm also a drama teacher. And I have been um, certified with the STEAM education via Georgette Yakman. I'm not sure, are you familiar with Georgette Yakman? She is the creator and founding researcher of the STEAM platform. So I trained with her last year, and I thought it was very important for drama to be included in that because the way I explain STEAM is the A is what, what connects the STEM to humans. Um, it's what puts the human element to science and technology. What's the point of a, you know, a brilliant washing machine that also washes clothes, that also washes dishes, but it's brown and orange stripes. Nobody's gonna <laughs> buy it, right? You've gotta be able to connect to the human piece of it. Um, you can't make a machine that a human goes home like this every day. It's gotta be ergonomically designed. You've gotta consider the human element. That's what brings the A into steam for me. Um, but my question is kind of almost similar to what this gentleman just spoke about. Yesterday, I had a talk with a principal at a school who is in a part of DeKalb, who their after school depart their after school programs are supported via the payments of the t the parents to the after school program, and it's a very disparate between North DeKalb and South DeKalb because our the the area that she works in, those parents are uh, parents of refugees or immigrants, um, you know, not Native American, Native English speakers. So they stay at home. They don't need the after school program. Those parents stay at home with those kids. So that directly impacts their budget of being able to offer enrichment programs to their students. Whereas in North Cap, they'll pay me whatever. Whereas at this particular school, they could only afford so much because their program is so small. Um, and I also am gonna be at the Fraser Center where special needs for uh, adults as well. But I think that, I think my question is, how can this help impact the disparity, mm. was that the word? Disparity, yeah. D between, in one county, how they have, their budget is based solely on the participants in the after school program. And these are those students who really need that literacy and the speech, you know, that programs like ours delivers. How do you, you know, Thank you. Am I asking the right question? Yeah, yeah Ayana, I'm gonna let you answer that. Sure, it seems on the surface, wouldn't know without finding out more about the program that this may be a program that's eligible for the community grant, which is the second grant. So it may seem a little bit not intuitive, but the donorschoose.org grant is really for teachers and grade level chairs to go directly for projects, but we do have a community side. Um, I will say that our target population are kids who are underserved and we think about that broadly, but we're thinking about low-income children, we think about children of color, who normally are not the children who are ultimately getting STEAM degrees, because part of the reason it's called the Pipeline Project is we want to change the trajectory of who is getting STEAM degrees, who's getting associate degrees, who's going into STEAM profession and careers. So I would say definitely go to the website, the blankfoundation.org slash pipeline. I believe it's on the front of the program, because there, there is a case where it's an after-school program or an enrichment program. They may be eligible for applying to the second part of the grant which is for those type of programs. And do you also wanna 
add a little bit about the, the classrooms that we're focused on in our donors choose.org grants are the particularly high need classrooms. Yes, so um, first, um, from donorschoose.org's own definition, high needs is um, highest poverty. If your uh, school um, qualifies as the highest poverty school in donorschoose.org, which means that you're 65% or greater free reduced for lunch in the school. And so that's what we're uh, considering as like the highest needs classrooms. And also right now we're targeting schools in Atlanta Public Schools, Fulton County Schools and DeKalb County Schools. Thank you. So Hi. these will be our last two questions, and I hope um, in order to get to both of them, get right to your I'm question. Go thank I'm, you. I'm Jody Brooks, and thank you. You funded half of my project yesterday. Great. I just want to let you know that, um, where's the app for Donors Choose? <laughs> As a teacher, we push an app, it's there. Lego has just made this creative movie maker. We need a donation app so that parents are more likely to go to. And um, I can't tell you this, I've had 21 projects funded. I am wow. thrilled to Whoa. My students are benefiting and thriving and we're scoring on tests and we're creative and we love what we do, but we need a quicker way to get to it. I know it sounds silly, but believe me, I wear a Stephen Colbert t-shirt because I'm like, I love him. He, t he sold his desk for donors choose. Yes. Know? And my husband talks about it at the coffee shop and we have everybody on our street doing it. But you know, you can only be a cheerleader as loud as your voice can carry. Yeah. And with an app, I really think that that would help. So that would might be something. I spoke to somebody in New York from Donors Choose the other day. They called because I was one of the teachers, and I said, I go, "We need an app." And she's yeah. like, "You're not the first person, but you're definitely the clearest." Yes. So we're waiting for the app. You're so right. I, I want to we owe you with one. You. <laughs> I, I can do it. So thank that, you. Know, you. You can laugh. So thank you. We, you are right, and and we owe you that. Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Tanya Barrett. I'm a teacher here in Atlanta. I teach gifted and talented. Um, in May, we held a STEAM carnival. It was our first ever for grades three through five. We had about 300 students come from 28 schools. So we're very excited, but we were blessed with having a school building that wasn't currently being used as a school building. Unfortunately, now it is being used as a school building, so we are left without a location. And I was just wondering, I know we, it's not the stuff that we're looking for necessarily, but we have been <coughs> reaching far trying to find a location. We actually want to expand it to K through um, five because mm -hmm. we did three through five. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there are any ideas or suggestions you have for organizations or you know, just funding sources that would help us find a place um, because money, of course, is not something we have a lot of, but we, we just need someone who would work with us. Yeah. Well, I'd love to hear from Ayana what, what sort of larger grants might be available. Um, I would say that so long as you're not looking to construct the, do construction on, on the space, no. um, it actually could be a project request on donorschoose.org. And in fact, there are even some teachers who have gotten funding to construct new playgrounds. Uh, the largest project ever funded through our site, $105,000 from a very low income community in Hawaii, was a teacher whose playground consisted of a pole, and a tether ball and broken concrete, and she got funding to build a new playground. So with some exceptions like that, so long as it's not capital construction, that actually is a project that you could create. We want to rent this space that yeah. we've found to hold this STEAM festival. Okay. That could be a project on our site. Um, to the extent that it costs, that it's like a $50,000, $40,000 project, your likelihood of funding success yeah. goes down to more like 20, 25%. So long as it's less than a couple thousand bucks, you've got a better than 50% chance of being funded. Are there institutional grants that you would point to? Uh, I will say that one thing that's exciting about this grant program is we are looking for innovation. Okay. Uh, things that will wow us <laughs> that we may not have thought of before. And so if you make a compelling case, like we're going to reach these many students and this is what's going to happen and we've done this before and here's the impact, I would completely encourage you to apply. Can I send um, you a video? <laughs> sure, you can include that as part of your application. Uh -huh. um, and I, I say that to say that, you know, I'm waiting to see the project that I never thought of, okay. that I never imagined somebody would have applied for. So the sky's the limit and, um, as far as I'm concerned with persons applying. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> So I, I, I want to encourage, we're, that was our last question, I'm sorry. Um, we are, I, I want to encourage all of you to go to the blankfoundation.org website, look at the 
slash pipeline, look at the projects, look at the uh, plans for the community-based as well as the donorschoose.org opportunities, because I think you'll find some place for yourself in, that, in those opportunities. Ayan, it might be a good idea also before we close to talk a little bit about what we're hoping the business community can contribute to this initiative. Yes, yeah, so um, when we think about the big goal of this, um, in one sense, we're thinking about like the jobs of the future, and we kind of joke that the jobs of the future are here uh, in terms of the skills that students need. And so I think about businesses and just kind of almost a self-serving interest of like, are you able to pull your employees from Atlanta? Um, are we now developing and investing in the kids here so that they will be able to go on and take the tech jobs that are right here in our city and we're not having to attract people from far away. So we're definitely interested in businesses who uh, may be interested in that, investing in kids now for the idea of what they're gonna do down the pipeline. And particularly if you, I would encourage business to go on donorschoose.org, see if you see um, projects that inspire you and you know, help invest in a teacher right now because that may be your employee about five, six years later. And we think there are great opportunities for mentoring programs and apprenticeships and internships in our local businesses. And we, we will be reaching out to a lot of the Atlanta CEOs to talk about those opportunities for our young people as well. So all ideas are welcome. We, Charles, we couldn't thank you more. Thank You've you. been wonderful. This has been a great day. We've shared the whole day with Charles. It's been really inspirational. And thank you, all of you, for being here and for what you do, those of you who are teachers every day in our classrooms. Thank you. Thank you.